Welcome to section 9.4b. Okay, gentle people, in this lecture, what we're going to talk about is something called calorimetry. Now, calorimetry is something that everyday industry uses, and it's to measure the energy of reactions. And so this gives us some very valuable thermodynamic data. So what we're going to use is we're going to use a device called a calorimeter. Now, they come in all shapes and sizes, and you guys, if you took the lab or are doing the lab, are going to run a calorimetry experiment. So here's the basic setup of a calorimeter. Now, what you guys are going to probably use is what's called a coffee cup calorimeter, and that means that you're going to put two styrofoam cups inside of each other. Now, the styrofoam cups act as an insulating device. And so basically, if you get to professional calorimeters, what you'll see is the container is a very good insulator. And the reason we want a good insulator is we don't want any heat exchange from the outside world to the inside of our container. And what that does is it makes the inside of this container my universe. So if this is my entire universe, I can apply the first law of thermodynamics. Any heat exchange has to be within the objects in this container. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour solutions into this calorimeter. So I'm going to dissolve my things usually into liquid water. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my reactants like so. Now what you guys have to remember is that if I go from reactants to products, I'm going to make and break bonds. If I'm forming and destroying bonds, that means I'm going to release energy. And so energy, it can either be on the product side or on the reactant side. This energy or this heat is going to go out into the water or the solution. What that means is my solution is going to heat up or cool down. Or in other words, it's going to have a change in temperature. So the heat that my solution gains or loses, well, I can take the specific heat of my solution times it by the mass of the solution, and times it by that temperature change it experienced. Now remember the first law of thermodynamics, and that was Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 dot 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 all equals zero. Let's take a look at all the heat exchanges I have in this calorimeter. Well, I just told you making and breaking bonds, well, that can release or gain heat. So that making and breaking bonds, let's call that the heat of reaction. Now, I told you that that heat is going to go into the solution. And so my solution is either going to heat up or cool down. And if that's the case, these are my two main heat exchanges. So what I can do is I can take this formula and rearrange it into this one where the Q of the reaction or the heat of the reaction is going to go into my solution. So that means they're equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign. So if that's the case, what I can say is that I can measure any heat of my reaction by simply taking the negative of the heat that is gained by my solution, or in other words, negative C solution times its mass times the change in temperature. And so this is a good way for me to talk about the energetics of making bonds and breaking bonds. So let's go ahead and talk about other aspects in the construction of my calorimeter. We have a thermometer here, and the thermometer is going to measure that change in temperature. And we have a stir that's going to make sure that everything is mixed well. The other component that we have in our calorimeter is we, we got to go ahead and have a lid on our calorimeter. But I want you guys to be careful. In a coffee cup calorimeter, this is not a sealed container. The lid is only there to provide insulation. So my system is under constant pressure. If my calorimeter is a coffee cup calorimeter, that means I'm under constant pressure. And so what that means is delta H equals QP. Or in other words, if I'm measuring the heat in this calorimeter, I'm also measuring the enthalpy because it's under constant pressure. So sometimes when people use this calorimeter, they say that they found the heat of reaction or the enthalpy of reaction, and they use them interchangeably because they are equal to each other. 
Now let's talk about another type of calorimeter, and these are going to be bomb calorimeters. Now these are usually used with organic compounds, so if you're a fuel scientist or if you guys are into the nutrition industry, they go ahead and use bomb calorimeters a lot. Now in a bomb calorimeter, I'm going to have constant volume. And the reason it's a constant volume is I'm going to do my reaction in a sealed container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for something that I'm interested in. And I'm going to put that into a metal container that conducts heat very well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that metal container and I'm going to dunk it into a bath of water. I'm going to start my reaction. Most of the time this is a combustion reaction, so they're going to give it a little bit of a spark in the presence of oxygen. The heat is going to come out of my metal container into the water of the calorimeter. Now because my reaction was sealed, I'm under constant volume, and the ramification of that is that my internal energy, which I described as Q plus W, if there's no change in volume, that means work is zero, and so the internal energy is going to be equal to the heat. Now, like I mentioned before, all this energy is going to be absorbed by the water. And so this is going to heat up the water inside my calorimeter. And so again, my calorimeter is this nicely insulated container. So we can use the first law of thermodynamics, Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3, dot, dot, dot equals zero. And so what we have is our Q of reaction. And I'm going to go ahead and put my Q of solution equals zero. Now remember, the solution in my calorimeter is my water bath that I'm surrounding my reaction with. And so what this means is, again, we can use this formula. My Q of reaction equals the negative C of solution times its mass times the change in temperature. Now, the one thing you guys will note is that this is a machine. So the mass of the water in this is always going to be the same. And also what's going to be the same is the heat capacity of water in this. Now, the other thing that we have to take into account with calorimetry is the calorimeter itself can absorb this energy. Now, because this is a machine and things don't change from experiment to experiment, these two are going to be constant. Now, if that's constant, I can combine them into a bigger constant and say, instead of saying that the mass is always changing, I'm going to call this the specific heat of the calorimeter or C calorimeter. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and practice a few of these out. So in this one, I want to cover example 9.5. So say you're a fuel scientist and you want to go ahead and see how energetic burning hydrogen is versus methane. So I'm doing this in a bomb calorimeter. Calculate the energy of me burning this per gram of material. So make sure you do the calculation for each substance. All right, gentle people, let's go ahead and start out with methane. So we're using a bomb calorimeter. So in bomb calorimetry, the internal energy is going to equal Q plus W. Since this is a constant volume process, I know that delta E equals QV. So what I can do is I can measure the energy of combustion by measuring the change in heat. And so heat for my reaction is going to equal negative K cal times delta T. So let's go ahead and put on our calorimeter value. So that's going to be 11.3 kilojoules per degree Celsius. Now my calorimeter had a temperature change of 7.3 degrees Celsius with methane. So if I were to crank the value out here, I get negative 82.49 kilojoules. And so that's the energy that was released in this particular experiment. But remember, I want to do this per gram of material. So always pay attention to your units. And so for this experiment, I got this amount of energy. And when I use methane, 
I used 1.5 grams of methane. And so if I go ahead and do this division out, I get 55 kilojoules worth of energy per gram of methane. Now we're gonna do the same for hydrogen. So again, we're doing this in bomb calorimeters. So my change in energy is equal to the heat exchange. And my heat of my reaction is still negative C cal delta T, and let's put in our values. So again, this is to emphasize the calorimeter is a machine. I'm gonna put in the same amount of water, it has the same mass, so that's why I can combine that into one term, the C cal, instead of saying that there's a mass because the machine is always gonna be constant. My change in temperature in here is 14.3 degrees Celsius, and so this turns out to be 162 kilojoules. So again, to remind you, this was an experiment I ran. In the experiment, this is how much energy was released. But I wanna know how much energy was released per gram. So I've gotta divide this by the amount of grams I used in that given experiment, which is 1.15 grams. This gets me 141 kilojoules per gram. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this problem is I wanted to show you the difference in energetics between burning these two compounds. If you look at this, burning hydrogen is gonna give you three times as much energy per gram of material. And if you are concerned about weight, so let's say NASA, when they're launching rockets into space, weight is a huge concern well then you wanna use the thing that gives you the most energy per gram. And this is part of the reason why NASA launches rockets by burning hydrogen instead of methane. So these are the two answers that you should have chose. One other thing I want to note is the negative sign. The negative sign on here is because the energy is being released by the reaction. So when you burn hydrogen or methane, it's an exothermic reaction. Exothermic means that heat is leaving my system. And that's why you have a negative sign there. So go ahead and do this calorimetry problem. I wanna give you practice on these types because these are worded a little bit differently than the last problem. In the last problem, what I did is I gave you the C cal of the calorimeter and that means the calorimeter with the water inside it. Some problems, what they will do is they will tell you what the empty calorimeter is. So that means this, the container, and then they will give you the amount of water inside the container. If you guys see that, what you have to do is to break up the calorimeter in two parts, the empty calorimeter and the water itself. So pay attention for words where they say empty calorimeter or the water in the calorimeter and so that you can break those two things apart. After you guys are done with this problem, hit the right answer. All right, gentle people, let's go ahead and tackle this problem. So the first thing we're gonna do is what we always do for a calorimetry problem and write down the first law of thermodynamics. And so what I wanna do is write down every heat exchange that is happening in this calorimeter. And the first thing we have is the Q of the reaction. And remember, this energy is coming from breaking bonds and forming bonds. Then we have our empty calorimeter. And so remember, this is the outside container without the water. And we know it's empty, not only because it says it's empty, but they also gave us information about the water in my calorimeter. And so we have to take into account the water that's inside because in this problem, we are treating this as separate entities. Now adding all this up gets us zero. So let's go ahead and extrapolate each one of these things. So they gave us a heat of combustion. Sometimes this is called the enthalpy of combustion. Now what you guys will note, a combustion reaction is an exothermic reaction. So I have to put a negative sign in front of what I'm about to write. So I'm gonna take the heat of combustion or the enthalpy of combustion and times it by the grams in this case, because they gave me the heat of combustion in kilojoules per gram. 
Now note, sometimes they give this to you in kilograms per mole. If they give it to you in kilograms per mole, simply times it by the amount of moles that you have. Next, we have the heat to the calorimeter. Now remember, the calorimeter is a machine. So instead of separating the specific heat and the mass, I'm combining it into one constant because mass is going to be constant. I'm going to times this by the change in temperature of that calorimeter. Lastly, the water that is contained inside the calorimeter, we're going to simply use the old formula Q equals MC delta T. And all of this equals zero. So let's go ahead and plug in our values. So the first thing I want to do is input the heat of combustion. Now you'll note the heat of combustion is given to you in kilojoules per gram. Now everything else in this problem is given to you in joules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a conversion and make everything into joules. So be careful when you do these types of problems and watch your units. So I'm going to take 19.4 kilojoules per gram and turn it into 19,400 joules per gram. Now I have two grams of material, and so I'm gonna go ahead and input that in. Next, we can do our calorimeter stuff. I am solving for kcal, so I'm gonna leave that there. And now I have to do the temperature change. So it ended up at 26.17, and it started at 23 degrees Celsius. Finally, we can input our data for our water. So I'll go ahead and put the mass, the specific heat, and then finally, I have to put the delta T. Now, the delta T is going to be the same as our empty calorimeter. Remember, the water is inside this empty calorimeter, and so it's going to have the same temperature change. So 26.17 minus 23, and this is degrees Celsius. Now, all of this equals zero. So let's go ahead and simplify this down a bit and do some of our calculations out. So we can account for our heat of reaction. We can go ahead and figure out what the change in temperature happens to be. And in this case, it's 3.17 degrees Celsius. And finally, we can see what water calculates out to be. And all of this is gonna equal zero. Now, what you guys have is one equation, one variable. So go ahead and solve for C cal. What you guys will get out is that C cal is going to equal positive 2,834 joules per degree Celsius. Now, I'm going to let you guys know that calorimetry constants, or C cals, they are usually given in kilojoules per degree Celsius. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and divide this by 1,000. So 2.83 kilojoules per degree Celsius. I hope that made sense, and remember to stay safe, Chem1B.